Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hi, David. Thank Hello. you for being here. Great to be here. Thank you all for coming, and I'm super excited to be having a David Marcus come here and speak with us a little bit. Before we dive into the title of How Money Moves in 2023, I would love to hear how David Marcus has moved through this startup slash payments ecosystem and kind of your journey to where you are today and working on Lightspark. Okay, I'll go very quickly okay. because there's just so much to talk about that's more interesting <laughs> than that part. But um, So basically, you know, I was a startup guy and uh, the last company that I started was a mobile payments company that then got acquired by PayPal and through a series of uh, unforeseen twists, I ended up leading PayPal for a number of years uh, and then went to Facebook to do non-payments related things for a bit, building the Messenger product. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it was really, really, really annoying to me that uh, money still moved in the way uh, that it still moves now in 2023, uh, coincidentally, uh, which is really not uh, not like the rest of the internet. Basically, mm -hmm. money moves like in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, and it, I was really frustrated, so I kind of pitched this idea to go build an open protocol for money on the internet that could become the standard protocol for money on the internet. We did that, you know, when I was at Facebook. Uh, and that was kind of an ill-fated uh, attempt because it was really, really hard to do that from a company like Facebook, despite the fact that we relinquished control uh, over that network, etc. So anyways, long story short, that didn't work. I left, um, and now I started a new company called Lightspark because I'm incredibly frustrated um, borderline angry with the fact that, you know, money still moves like in the 60s. I mean, think about it that way. It's yeah. like, you know, as if, you know, you couldn't send an email between Gmail and Yahoo. When I was running PayPal, we acquired Braintree and Venmo. Mm -hmm. You still to this day cannot send money between Venmo and PayPal and they're part of the same company. And so, you know, you should be able to send money like you send a text message or an email globally, instantly at a very low cost. And that's still not the case. And yeah. so it's, it's, you know, really a passion of mine to go fix this. Yeah. And, and we were talking about this earlier when we were kind of uh, backstage was just, it's sort of been your life mission. It's not just been from the mobile payments company that you started, but really it's been something that you've sort of held on to and it's been a vision for a long time. So seeing this come together at Lightspark is amazing. Tell us a little bit more about, or however much you want to share about Lightspark and kind of what you are building. Well, it's a bit early for us to you know, talk about all of the things that we're doing. But like the, the one thing I would say is that, you know, we're, we ha are very focused on the Lightning Network, mm -hmm. which is basically a payments protocol on top of Bitcoin. Uh, and we chose Lightning and Bitcoin because it is the most decentralized uh, network of money today. Um, and, uh, and so we're building on the Lightning Network because we believe that it is going to be, you know, potentially a winning protocol for money on the internet. Uh, and we're trying to make it enterprise grade and enable more companies to actually uh, get on the network. As a matter of fact, this morning, uh, we announced that, you know, we're, we're powering the first bank on the Lightning Network. And, and this is even, you know, thank you. But this yes. is even before we actually launch our product. Mm -hmm. uh, they were one of our early closed beta partners and decided, okay, this is actually good enough. We're going to go. We think we still have a little bit more work to open it up to the rest of the world and the public, but uh, we're very excited about this first step. And for the, I guess, for the bank partner today, what has been the solution that they've been thinking through? And kind of when you're having those conversations, are they right away completely get it, understand they're saying absolutely we're on board, or is there an education perspective to what you're doing for them? There's always an education with you know new technologies, new networks, et cetera. But in the case of Zappo, this bank, uh, they've been a Bitcoin native mm -hmm. company for such a long time. Uh, and they really wanted to enable fast, reliable, you know, really low cost payments for their clients. And, uh, and Lightning is actually pretty complicated because you need to open nodes and maintain them and open channels and rebalance liquidity and do all kinds of different things that you know, regular mainstream companies don't want to do. And so what we try to do is obfuscate a lot of the complexity and make it really simple and reliable and enterprise grade basically to use the Lightning network. And you know, that's probably why they ended up uh, working on our platform. Yeah, and the and Zappo being your first partner that you're going to get to work with is the initial is the idea to spend more time with bank partners like this. Is it sort of to enable that movement for, as you said, enterprise grade payment 
and or are you focused on sort of smaller customers, smaller clients? Give us a little bit of a sense. Yeah, of the one that. thing I will say is that we're not going to be a consumer company. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be at the heart of the network and try to enable large players to actually onboard on the Lightning network or, or smaller uh, players and startups that want to build new payments experiences on an open interoperable uh, network um, that moves money you know, globally yep. instantly. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're focused on really building those tools and these services, so basically enterprise grade, developer friendly services uh, for all of these audiences. And I think you know, anyone who's moving money will end up needing an open protocol for money on the internet. So our audience is pretty broad. Yeah. And, and I guess speaking of broad audiences, as you think about international use cases, we're both immigrants, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, there are a ton of use cases of why cash needs to be able to move from one country to another. But maybe share a little bit about some of the international use cases you do see for LightSpark and kind of what you guys can build around that. Well, I mean, in the U.S., the vast majority of payments today move on ACH, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, uh, a very archaic, uh, crummy <laughs> platform that moves money um, uh, in three days. Um, and it's low cost, but it's three days. And so that's just for domestic payments. It's about like 67, 65% last I checked of the volume of payments in dollar amounts that travel on ACH in the U.S., uh, which is kind of pretty embarrassing, honestly, mm -hmm. for a country like ours. Um, and, and so that's just domestic. So international now is even more complicated. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate enough that, you know, we can call someone to do an international wire, but right. for the vast majority of people who want to do a swift transfer, which is also a super archaic, like, 70s era payment system that requires correspondent banks to have bank accounts with one another to clear uh, transactions uh, based on a, a, a very... You know, uh, you know, completely batch processed messaging right. platform. Uh, they have to walk into a branch, pay fifty bucks uh, to actually send an international. Irrespective wire. of the size of the actual funds. Yeah, being yeah, totally. Yeah, so it's, it could be ten dollars. It could be 10, yeah, 000. and or like if you're if you're trying to do remittances, mm -hmm. then you're going to use like the Western unions of this world, etc. And there also like there's like you know extraction on on all sides, and it's very expensive and and complicated. And actually, people on the receiving side of remittances, they have to go into the physical world. Uh, and often they receive a, a, a receipt via WhatsApp or mm -hmm. you know, messaging platform, and they go in a physical place, they wait in line, it's generally the place that they get mugged because everyone knows right. that this is where they get the yeah. cash out, and they wait hours upon hours, pay a very hefty fee to get their cash out, and you know, it's like the people who can afford it the least who yeah. are paying the more, the most, like, yep. so it's you know, not okay. No, it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, we've thought a lot about this and it's been an interesting journey to see what the end user experience is like and definitely prohibitive. Um, I guess for many folks in the audience as we think about sort of the crypto world today and kind of building in that ecosystem, um, you came from sort of the not, you came from traditional finance or rather fintech at this point, right? How did you, is it primarily just you see the use case, the future, the vision and that's what got you excited, got you over the hurdle, but I guess if you're giving advice to the government, if you're giving advice to regulators, how do you think about getting them around some of the crypto regulation that needs to come into place? Well, I think there's crypto and crypto. So there's crypto, the speculative side of things. I'm going to get rich quick scheme thing. I'm going to you know list a token <laughs> and dump it on the public market and all yeah. of that. Uh, and we're not doing any of that, just for the record. Uh, we're building on Bitcoin, so, yep. you know. Um, but, uh, but I think there's that, and then there's the utility. And I think you can't throw the baby with the bathwater, right? You have to actually create an environment that mm -hmm. is going to bring innovators into the U.S. or keep them into the U.S. at the very least. Um, and, you know, I think it's of national interest, honestly. It's going to be a technology that is going to create so much value in the next decade that we cannot afford to have innovators in the space actually leave the country. So we need clear regulation and we need clarity so that people know exactly how to build those you know, game-changing technologies and products and services within the bounds of 
a regulatory framework that makes sense. And are you seeing that today? Is that people are leaving the United States to go build crypto? I mean, we've known that there are great crypto com companies being built in the U.S., but also a lot internationally. Are you seeing sort of that brain drain and people saying the U.S. just doesn't have it together and we don't know what they're going to do? We're going to go somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of that. And, you know, I mean, a big example of that was FTX, frankly, mm -hmm. who, who, you know, was in the Bahamas. So, you know, I think that kind of uh, says it all. I think the, the problem is actually that you need clarity, right? People want to abide by regulations and laws in mm -hmm. general, like, you know, certainly people here probably. Uh, and, you know, they want to know what the, the, the rules of the road are. And, yep. you know, if it's unclear, then they'll go to places where they have clarity, where they know that what they're going to build is not going to be attacked left and right five years, ten years into them building a, a valuable company. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work, I mean, or I guess for you, this has now become a mission. This is part of who you are. Are you thinking about kind of the work and the education you want to do for regulators, for the community? How much of sort of the being part of the crypto community is essential to you and essential to LightSpark and the education going forward? Well, yeah, education is very important, but I think, you know, that's also one of the reasons we picked Bitcoin, because at least there's one asset where there's absolute regulatory clarity in terms of the asset not being a security, and I think that's Bitcoin and that's it, basically, mm -hmm. at this stage. Uh, and so that's why we're building on that network. Um, but yes, of course, like we, as a community, as, a, as an industry, we also need to get way, way better at explaining what the technology is actually going to do for real people and businesses and what real world problems it's going to solve. And I think that the industry in general has not been that good at that. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's enough companies that have given your industry a little bit of a bad reputation. Yeah, and sure. I think that's been challenging for sort of your regular fiat users. And so I guess as we're talking about this, everyone's, it's sort of in the news, crypto winter is here, people are leaving the industry. Um, crypto investors, funds are changing size. How do you think about the cooling off and kind of what advice I would say? Well, maybe let's start with how do you think about the cooling off and what's your perspective there? I think it's great because what's cooling off, um, I mean, very selfishly, was, what's cooling off is not something that I was particularly interested or drawn by, mm -hmm. which was like the speculative side of crypto and, and, and that business. And that part the is tourism. cooling off. And yeah, and I mean, it's just like people wanted to get rich quick, right? right? It's you know human nature. Um, but you know, I think that now we're really focused on things that are really going to provide a lot of utility in the world, and I think that's great. And for us, it's fantastic because we can actually recruit amazing people who are mission aligned. They want to build things that are really going to fix problems for people and businesses around the world. Uh, and I think it's a great time to build. And actually, most of the very successful companies have been built during downturns. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so for builders, it's a fantastic time if you have the capital and you know, the wherewithal to actually go and press on uh, for something that you care deeply about. It's a fantastic time to build. Yeah, I guess we were talking a little bit about your son and his interest in being an entrepreneur and just so many more folks getting into entrepreneurship much younger and getting in earlier. I, I, it would be awesome to hear we're as you said, it is a great time to build. We feel similarly, and it's a great time to be in the market, kind of experimenting, learning. But what are kind of, I guess, the couple of things you would tell an entrepreneur today, and we do have a lot of founders in the audience, we have people here who are building in, you know, thinking about fundraising, thinking about their journey. What are the couple things that you think they need to focus on in the next six to 12 months as we get through what could be some of the harder times? Well, I think Larry Summers earlier said that, you know, uh, entrepreneurship or creating stuff is like 8% an idea and 92% <laughs> execution. Yeah. I actually think it's like probably one in 99 actually. Mm -hmm. But but at the end of the day, um, I think the, the most important thing is that you build something that is actually going to be valuable to someone. Right. And so you need to focus on what's the job to be done for the thing that you care about building. What is the problem in the world that you're uniquely passionate and skilled at going fixing. And you know, if you're focused on a real problem mm -hmm. and you're mission driven and you, you're not completely wrong in the thing that you want to go fix and you try hard enough, then you know, there's a huge opportunity. But, uh, but I think you know, a lot of, 
there are so many companies that fail because they just want to build a cool tech or a cool thing, but it doesn't solve any problem. It's like, okay, let's build this tech and then people will come and use it in ways that we don't know. Like that rarely works, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be really super passionate about fixing a real problem in the real world. Is entrepreneurship for everyone? No, of course not. I think we're seeing that more so now than ever before. Um, as people, I guess, and this is more from, I got this from a, a founder who had reached out and knew that you were coming on. Um, as they're thinking about fundraising and as they're thinking about storytelling and like building out, as, as you mentioned, you want to find a real problem, you need to have the focus. What is it that you think resonated when you went through your fundraising journey? Obviously, you are David Marcus. It's a little bit different. But maybe even when you were building your mobile payments company the first time around, um, how do you kind of find the right people to work with? And how do you know that they were the right partners for you? Yeah. I mean, the first time around was really, really hard. Uh, <laughs> But look, I think at the end of the day, uh, it, it's funny, we were discussing this with someone who's maybe in the audience here, but um, you have to go pitch and pitch and pitch and pitch. Like, and, you know, I, I remember the first time I was fundraising, I probably had like 100 meetings. And at the time, there was no such thing as a Zoom pitch. Like you had to <laughs> get on a plane and go, and I was yeah. in Europe, so lots of planes. And so you had to go and meet people and pitch them. And you pitch, you pitch, you pitch. And you get feedback from these pitches. And you know the, the feedback that you get, if people are honest with you, makes your product, your vision, better, sharper, et cetera. And you know, maybe you'll end up you know, pitching 100 people, but then you'll find the one. You only need one. And so you know, typically, that's, uh, that's a process. It's hard. Entre entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Uh, but if you do it enough, and if you're really fixing a real world problem, and you're passionate and skilled, then you'll find someone. Yeah, and I, I guess you've obviously had some great investors that you've worked with for a long period of time, from your first company to what you're, who you're working with at Lightspark today. It sounds like these are marriages. These are long-term relationships that you're sort of getting into. Yeah. And you're like, these are people I want to spend maybe more time than with my spouse. <laughs> yeah, no, you need to find the right people for sure. Yeah, awesome. Well, before we, I know that we've kind of, we have a lot of things we could get through. I did want to, I did want to take a little bit of time and, or quickly just go through a rapid fire round, mostly because I have a lot of fun doing this. Uh -huh. um, you have a little bit of a heads up, maybe a couple questions you haven't heard. So before we end today, fiction or nonfiction? Both. Okay. What are you reading right now? Uh, a, a really good book that's called The Escape Artist that talks about the teenager escaping Auschwitz to warn the world about what's happening and no one believing him. Okay. In office, work from home. Definitely in office. I hate work from home. Wow, strong opinion. With a Mark, passion. Where With a you? passion. <laughs> yeah. There, Mark. Mark would be happy to hear that. Um, what's your favorite part about being a CEO? That I can control my schedule entirely. Another leader that inspires you. Uh, I mean, I've always been a fan of Churchill for many reasons. Uh, notably, that you know he was able to go through hell and not lose his sense of humor. But I have many others. That's all we have for today. Thank you yeah. all. I really all right. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Guys.